Eh, buonasera a, a tutti, grazie per il vostro interesse per questo nostro incontro con Nicola Parti, eh, che vi presento qua, e con noi eh, Francesca Bernasconi, che insieme a me si è occupata di tutto il progetto. E, eh, tout d'abord, je dois m'excuser à tous ceux qui s'attendaient qu'on allait faire cette conversation en français. C'était prévu à l'origine, mais euh, apparemment, il y a eu un grand intérêt aussi euh, au dehors de Lugano. Donc, euh, on fera un streaming live ce soir, euh, pour lequel il y a eu beaucoup d'intérêt. Et pour ceci, euh, avec Nicolas, on a décidé qu'on va faire euh, la conversation en anglais. Ah, merci de votre compréhension. So we switch to English. Um, and we're very happy to have uh, Nicola here. Actually, uh, he came to Lugano first in 2018 uh, to visit the place, to see the space. Uh, we had been working together in 2013 after I had uh, seen a show actually at Gregor Steiger's gallery. Hello, Gregor. Thank you for coming. <laughs> and I invited uh, Nicola then to a big group show that we did at the Museum Falkwang in Essen, which was uh, mainly uh, about young artists working in space, painting in space. So uh, he came, and I think we're going to see some images yeah. later, and did a great job. And uh, so, Um, with the spaces here in Lugano, which we have at, uh, at the lower floor, which you all know from uh, previous exhibitions, uh, it was immediately clear to me that this might make a nice setting for a show of Nicola. Because from the very beginning on, of course, uh, as he is now a mature artist, <laughs> and no longer a, <laughs> an emerging artist. <laughs> the idea was that we discussed that we should like to do uh, not only one of his in-situ projects, as he had done uh, so many before in various places and various museums all over the world, as you will also see later during the presentation. But uh, we also wanted to have some kind of mini mid-career or half mid-career, half <laughs> mid, almost mid, close to mid-career <laughs> retrospective. So uh, we're also going to be talking about that. So the works in the show are actually going back to 2012 or 13. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. But um, the new ones are very new because uh, Nicola arrived here uh, already a few weeks ago and he's been very busy with uh, many assistants, thanks to them all, uh, on preparing uh, the work and doing the work, because uh, the show includes four uh, major wall pieces that he did in situ here with pastels on the wall. You could see an image here of him working uh, downstairs, and into which then uh, we integrated, as you will be able to see, in some uh, sneak preview slides tonight, and in, in full uh, then next week, um, he integrated a selection of paintings, sculptures, and pastels. And also, uh, not at the least, um, he designed the entire architecture because I think that's an important uh, aspect of his work that we're going to be talking about. It always includes, of course, not only the work, the mobile, the movable works, but wherever he can, in the way, uh, to the extent possible, uh, according to the situation, of course, he always loves and uh, in a great way uh, succeed in transforming and integrating and creating uh, an adapt space for the work then to be shown there. So, uh, should we start with the slideshow? Let's start. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so, this is, uh, has this, <laughs> <laughs> well, tell us about this work. <laughs> Which, uh, <laughs> uh. I guess we decided to have a, maybe a quick run out of, uh, of you know, h how I started and what I've been uh, doing in the last, like, uh, I guess, almost 30 years uh, now. Uh, and I think we wanted to include this, this uh, graffiti that I'd done uh, when I was 17 or 18. Um, Because I quite often talk about, um, you know, so I get asked often, like, oh, 
where this relation to space and like working with uh, architecture, like or th this site-specific uh, way of working painting is from, and I, I very often refer to um, kind of my decade of doing graffiti because it was uh, very site-specific to say the least because it was never <laughs> obviously on the canvas or in the studio, it was always outside. Uh, and, uh, and typically the image that we see here that was in the uh, uh, bullet train, the t t t TGV, uh, the, the, the one that was going to, you can see that it's, it's actually old from the, <laughs> the design of it now. But it was this beautiful uh, orange kind of TGV that was going from Lausanne to, uh, to Paris and there was kind of the golden uh, price for graffiti artists because it was the most guarded train, uh, you know, by the security in the Lausanne kind of uh, uh, rail station and you had very, very small amount of time to do it. You had like maybe a window of like 15 minutes between two kind of shift of, uh, of guards. And, uh, and also the train will in the morning go to Paris uh, and then so friends there could take a picture of it and they can see it when it was going to Paris. But uh, I think all those years of doing graffiti really kind of um, made me enjoy and, and, you know, wanted to really work with the the the, um, the, um, the environments that I can paint on, and maybe the other thing that I refer quite often with the uh, the graphite is the maybe the performative a aspect of uh, of spray paint because it's uh, when you do it the visual thing is <laughs> maybe as you can see it's not really the uh, the main goal uh, it's because it's very the code are very kind of strict actually you have to do letters more or less it's like but what what is very important. Is to is to do it and uh, the joy of doing it a bit like music maybe when you're young it's like maybe the quality of the music is not that uh, important but the the energy and the experience the performance that you that you do uh, is is the is the main thing and as you can imagine like when you're a group of friends and you're like um, you know very young adults like the doing this it's uh, it's obviously a, a great deal of fun so I kind of own a lot of that period. I paid my, uh, my, uh, my debts. Did you get caught? <laughs> yeah, did you get arrested? <laughs> for the people. I got arrested a few times and, uh, and I paid so like, uh, at, least, at least a bit of it. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so that's... Um, they had to repaint the train. Uh, yeah, they were always saying that the, the, they were always billing a super high cost of it because they were saying that they will have to, which was a little bit real. Uh, typically the TGV there's not that many in the Lausanne, so if they have to stop it to clean it, mm -hmm. they will basically bill you for the entire stop of the train. So they will like, you know, make like some kind of crazy calculation. All the tickets of all the trains <laughs> will be, well, that's what you own, the, not because we have to clean it. Because the product is not, the, the cleaning actually is not that expensive, but it was more like, you know, maintaining the train in the, um, in the train. Now they wish they would have kept it. <laughs> <laughs> well, in Italy, because we went to Italy a few times, and uh, and uh, they didn't really erase them then. I don't know how it is exactly mm -hmm. now, but uh, it was like pretty wild, mm -hmm. uh, and we got caught in Italy too. But uh, yeah, maybe we're not that good and not getting caught. <laughs> but I stopped when I was around. Actually, I stopped when I started art school, more or less. Mm -hmm. I was like, oh, maybe this is a good occasion to flip my energy to something. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it was you know slightly less fun in the beginning, and it got more and more and more fun, and now it's kind of equal. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> yeah. So maybe like uh, yeah, that that's uh, well, that's a very good example of how I uh, I, I used I mean in a very direct way uh, the spray paint kind of years because this is like a a, a wall in. A, in Glasgow, after lo at the art school in Lausanne, uh, uh, after two years after my uh, my degree, I left to Glasgow to do a, a master, and um, and uh, that's probably like, and I stayed six years there in Glasgow, and it's during that time um, that uh, with some friends, a friend of, of of mine, like organized this kind of project in some kind mm -hmm. of uh, a rundown area, and uh, and I painted that big. Um, big graffiti that's, uh, I don't know if you see the size, but it, it's, it's actually, I mean, maybe you see it, but it's, it's actually very big, and the spray paint was really, an incre it's an incredibly fast. But this was legal, it was a commission. That was completely legal. <laughs> yeah. no, no. I kind of stopped, and, uh, and, I, and I mean, I don't know, I don't feel like really like the urge to do it anymore. <laughs> <laughs> it took me a long time to, uh, it's really like um, an addiction, that's for sure. Mm -hmm. But yeah, it took me like, I guess, 
almost 10 years. Mm -hmm. <laughs> To really like, now I really don't need, need to do it or anything. <laughs> I'm clean. <laughs> I only do it in the museum. <laughs> so, uh, we have prepared a series of images to show our guests and people that are following from home um, how you have brought this energy from the outside to the inner spaces where you work and how you transform the spaces for each of your exhibitions, so we'll... Actually, this is the show where uh, you where worked met. with uh, <laughs> Tobia. Exactly, yeah. So this, um, yeah, so that was, uh, that, was uh, that was a few anecdotes there, but that was... Uh, so he invited me to this, uh, this very ambitious show with um, a group of artists that uh, occupied fairly large uh, amount of space uh, in, this, in this very big museum, uh, the Wolfgang in Essen, and, uh, and there was some... I was a fairly young, uh, not that experience, uh, with a lot, not that much experience when I, when I went there. And, and next to me, I think it was Frank's uh, Arkham, Aquaman. Right. Mm -hmm. And uh, <laughs> so I, as, as, as I witnessed the difference of uh, professional... Who arrived with 20 assistants. Yeah, um, <laughs> I, I went, I, yeah I went there by myself. <laughs> and uh, it's, this is all made with charcoal on the wall with my hands. You, the big tree, like you can see my mm -hmm. movement. Yeah, that's an interesting point. So this were a tactile element. Yeah, it's very, very it's, physical. It's, it's, it's yeah. very basic, it's very, very performative. physical. The work exactly, with the yeah. pastel on the wall, you really yeah. use your fingers and you feel yeah, it. Yeah, exactly. Happen. It's still like the those like from this show. It's like a musician, it's not stuff like with a paintbrush. So exactly, it's very like the, uh, it's, it's very tactile immediate, yeah. element. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I really like it, but obviously it's a little bit like um, damaging for the hands, or it's very physical. And uh, But yeah, this, 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 um, this show, I was by myself, so you have to do the sketches, tape, it's pretty high up on ladders and like a scissor lift and everything. And next to me there was Frank's Arkhaman team. There was probably 10 people, like they brought their own table, like special tape, special paints. And he was only coming like maybe an hour a day. And then he was going, I mean, and I was literally covered with chalk. I suffered a lot on this one. I remember actually very well, I was going to the hotel and I was really like, this is, and I got it really close. I was almost, didn't, didn't, manage, didn't manage to do it, but. As I made the parallel, and I always go back to that, like I think I really enjoy those those um, those those moments because uh, um, I guess again it's my graffiti time that I, 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 there's something very uh, accelerating and perfor performative to it, and uh, you definitely don't have that in the studio because uh, in a, in a site specific mural you have a time a timeline that is uh, that is very clear. You have to do it. You, I mean the very often it's three weeks, um, but sometimes, like it's, let's say in an art fair, it can be one day or like two days. So that's actually very close mm -hmm. to it. It can be okay, you have like 12 hours to do the, the mural. Uh, and it's, it's, it's pretty fun because you're like, okay, like it's very like, uh, I need to do it. And, uh, and I don't really work with um, tons of assistants because the, uh, the problem is that if it's really drawn, like it's difficult to, um, to ask you know, people to fill or like, or to cut, or, uh, because there's, l there's a lot of drawings, but um, so often I, I end up like working a lot uh, by myself. But again, I kind, of, I kind of like it. When there's actually a lot of people helping, it, sometimes it gets l less, uh, I don't know, you lose a bit of your groove. <laughs> it's like you start to, a bit like being less in the, uh, in the, uh, in the, uh, in the, in the spirit of the mural. Um, but uh, yeah, that was a, yeah, that was a very fun uh, experience. Here, fast forward. <laughs> <laughs> or fast forward. Yeah, I mean, I think like I think we're showing part of that uh, that uh, that image because uh, in this show in 2017, uh, I think in uh, in Karma in New York, it's the kind of the first time that I, d d I decided to do those uh, arches that I've been using a bit, uh, <laughs> a bit intensely since then. Uh, and what happened is that uh, the Karma Gallery uh, was this like rectangles, rectangular space that is, that is a very nice volume, but uh, I felt that it was like, like you know, like not big enough to just like even if it was big enough, I would probably cut it also. But it was basically the, the a, a size almost in between, um, like you you would get into the space and you will see all the work, and I thought it would be good to actually cut it in. Uh, in, in free spaces to basically create different moods uh, instead of like, you know, which is a very, I guess, a very obvious, you know, scenographic thing to do in, in, in shows. 
and to do the the um, the, uh, the the path between each rooms. Um, I'm, uh, I think like maybe like a year before we went to uh, Florence and uh, and uh, oh yeah, here you go. <laughs> the, uh, <laughs> and uh, we visited the uh, the, uh, the the Saint Marco um, uh, convents and with the, those uh, famous fresco from uh, from Fra Angelico and, and and his team and uh, and all the cells of the monk are kind of ar I mean there's a lot of arches obviously in the in the in the courtyard but also all the cells and there's a lot of arches in the painting that we probably quite all familiar with but. Basically, what, what happened is when I was visiting and I, I really felt, oh, the, the, the design of the space helps so much the, uh, the appreciation and the physicality of experiencing the painting that, uh, I, I, I mean, I literally say, oh, maybe I, sh I should, do, should try the same in a, in a slightly <laughs> cheaper, cheaper version. Uh, and, uh, and I have to say that, uh, yeah, as soon as I did it, I, 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 I thought it was very successful, like the, uh, the effect of going through not super high arches here they're very high, but uh, actually some two are not that high. But the first one that I did, then you, I was I described it as a, um, as a kind of a hug, like from the from the from the you know from from above, uh, because you really have the, even if it's a f you know fake arch, like the originally like the arch will have all the weights of the structure, you know of the stones that actually like join in the middle. So you have an incredible energy right there when you pass, you know between them, but I think like even if it's not obviously the same, it's just, you know, wooden, it's, it's a shape. It's not an actual mm -hmm. structural sh shape in, in many of the things that I did, I mean, all of them. But you still have this, uh, this feeling that when you go through it, you really have a, a weight that, and it's, I mean, in the, mo in the, in the, in the monk in the monastery, it's obviously like the, the, the idea of being humble and make you feel like, oh, like there's something bigger than you that is just surrounded. Um, and I, yeah, I, f I, f I felt there was a very mm -hmm. interesting thing to experiment with. A recurring element is the trompe l'oeil. Uh, did you f use it first here? Or is it no, I did. Uh, I mean, in that particular picture, actually, it's a show in China where they did okay. also a lot of arches. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. the first time that I did, it was before the arches, actually. It was uh, maybe a year before in, in Switzerland, too, in, in Neuchâtel. Right. Mm -hmm. And uh, what happened with the trompe l'oeil marble that uh, I've been doing a lot since then, it's that uh, I was living in Brussels then, and a friend of mine that I knew from Switzerland, Sara Magnetti, that is from Ticino, <laughs> uh, came to Brussels to study the, this school called Van der, Van der Kellen. Uh, and she got to know the school because this this was a little bit of a chain uh, of artists that uh, called Lucy Mackenzie, that is from Glasgow. Uh, and she was using a lot of this trompe l'oeil in, in her work, and she loved the work, and she went there to... Uh, to kind of learn that, that, that those different techniques. And when I saw her doing that, I was really like uh, kind of fascinating by it. And I uh, asked her, oh, do, you, do you want to um, work with me and like uh, use you, you new um, uh, techniques to, to, to basically like paint uh, on, on, on different structure that, I, that, that we did? And she, uh, she, was, she, she, she said yes, and we started to do this uh, collaboration uh, in the last, like, uh, well, since 2017, in the last four years. And she came here with another friend of her from that did the school too, and she did, like, a, a very uh, a very big amount of, uh, of the marble. And she's also using that technique in, in her own work. So she has all those different kind yeah. of uh, repertoire. And, uh, yeah, it's, it's been a great We're addition. We're going to see too. pictures of her work later on. Yeah, so. perfect. <laughs> Here is still about the arches, but maybe another thing that it's interesting to present to our guests is another strategy that you use to create, uh, transform the space, this idea of layering, so creating a mural painting and then hanging another painting that in some cases can be your painting, like here in Lugano. And here at the flag in New York, you did both things. So you presented works from other artists on top of your works. Yes. And uh, so yes. So what I think what happened is that uh, I was doing the uh, actually after the one in uh, in Essen, I was doing those landscape, uh, and I was not putting anything on top of it. But I think I think in maybe in, Nuren in Nuremberg I did another show, and I, that's the first time that I think I did I did one of those charcoal landscapes, and I put it like a, a portrait on top of it. And maybe a year later, I think it's because it was site specific, and I was putting something. And I was like, oh, maybe I could like also 
basically reproduce or paint some something, a painting from someone else, um, and just do a, a, a collage of, of my work on top of someone else, and I can use the the scale. And the first one that uh, that I did was uh, in in New York and an art fair actually in in, in Dependence, and I I reproduce this. Uh, this uh, um, portrait of Picasso called La Celestine, and I, I mm -hmm. hanged like a, um, a landscape on top of it, and I was, I think I was, yeah, I was very excited. I was like, oh, this is an, a great kind of uh, new territories to explore because like it's kind of these endless possibilities. I can reproduce whatever I want and put something on me on top of it because what happened is that because the, um, the because it was a mural and it was a fair mural and it was basically. Typically in New York, the first one, it only lasted for four days. Mm -hmm. and then it was removed. I felt there was, a, you know, it was not really, almost, it was not really something that it would stay. So I, f I felt like more free to just like, oh, I can just take, I can sample something, mm -hmm. paint it, show it, uh, and then it will, it will just disappear. And uh, so I, I, I did like the Valoton uh, a few times, one in, uh, um, in the Swiss Institute in, uh, in Paris and another Two of those Valotto in uh, in Milan at Kaufmann Repetto, and uh, and I th yeah I think that's the first time in Flag that uh, I hanged someone else on someone else, <laughs> so <laughs> my involvement start to be less and less. <laughs> and also, it's almost purely technical in a way, and I guess like mm. a little bit of the collage thing because here so that's a, a portrait of uh, Madame de Pompadour by um, by Boucher that is cropped. Uh, so you only see the the dress and almost no human parts, only the hands uh, on, on on the on the on the right. And then on top of it, there's a Degas a painting called uh, La Conversation, which is two women like kind of uh, touching some some kind of fabric. Um, and that's like also like gave me an amazing uh, um, kind of. Uh, so, I mean, it was a, a great source of inspiration. I thought oh, that's also another an, an, an great. And for that show, so for that show, I, I did. Uh, there was uh, one, also another, uh, a Fragonard with a, a contemporary artist, Robin William, that was on top of it. And there was uh, another very crop version of Fragonard um, uh, that is at the Freak, the, 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 the Pursuit of Love. Uh, and I did also one of my pastel on top, and on top I put it like um, uh, Jean-Baptiste Perrono, uh, which is an artist from the 18th century on top of it. But uh, yeah, that was very exciting to see like the, um, what was happening when you do those college, mm -hmm. those college, because it's very different than do it uh, um, on a computer and printed. You, you have a, you, there's a physical mm -hmm. physicality of it that is that completely changed mm -hmm. the experience. Because mm -hmm. here you really have, when you see it in real, I mean you'll see it here, like the the the, the size of it and the the fact that it's pastel on the wall. So it's fairly like it's very very vibrant and alive, and it was also made fairly quickly. Then the, the guy is obviously like an object that uh, has this kind of patina mm -hmm. and and and, uh, and, um, and value to it that is very. I think I found it very interesting to uh, to mix them. So it's been definitely very exciting to try those. <laughs> okay. And now in Lugano. That's that's <laughs> right now. <laughs> we only have uh, five days left. <laughs> We're gonna have to. <laughs> that's a live camera of the space. So we wanted to show you the starting point. So uh, when Nicholas came to visit the space, of course he visited the, the whole museum, but pretty soon you decided with Tobia that the, the space that you wanted to use was the, the biggest one we have downstairs. And uh, it was important to show this image because then you will see how the space has been completely transformed. So. When Nicholas goes somewhere, it's not only hanging work of art, but really creating uh, an experience, <laughs> creating a, a new, transforming completely the place. And that's why we wanted to start with this, to show you the Lugano project. Mm -hmm. And this is what... <laughs> <laughs> that's, how it, that's, how, that's, that's how it works. <laughs> So yeah, that's very yeah, that's interesting. Uh, that's a very good uh, uh, choices of two images because uh, what happened with the uh, this this project and I really never had that you know especially on that scale is that the uh, the rectangle that is that it, the, I mean the museum the rectangle of this space is made to be cut out obviously like uh, mm -hmm. I mean some people could do a show with adding no walls 
um, uh, but most of the time th those type of structure are made to build walls right. and, and, uh, and that's the, the design is made for that. So it was really incredible to have uh, something that scale because it's obviously a really large space, very high ceiling and a, a very beautiful volume uh, with those like eight columns that's I guess structure. So you basically have to walk with them because they're, you obviously can't move mm -hmm. those. Um, and uh, so basically what I, what I did, I just, we do a little model like that uh, in the studio, only with the column, and then I just play around to put the, uh, you know, walls and, and um, but that's, I mean, I have to say that some, this thing came, came like extremely, I mean, that's actually obviously a later version, but this really like uh, central division with the two rooms on the sides uh, came, came very quickly and uh, and uh, yeah, I, th I thought it was like, okay, let's be very ambitious with the, uh, the idea and let's try to really, um, you know, go for it and, and build that. And uh, I feel like extremely, uh, you know, lucky and, uh, and fortunate to have been, to been able to collaborate with the museum to be able to do such a project because it's obviously an ambitious and it takes some time, it costs some money <laughs> to, to do such a project. So it's, it's really, yeah, you can see work like... Work in uh, progress. Yeah, it's like really a, a pretty incredible... Uh, construction sites <laughs> and that's yeah that's that's like the uh, the you'll see the four walls uh, th where um, I, I, I came to do uh, the, 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 the four the four pastels that uh, that are in the, the exhibition but uh, yeah I mean f again coming back maybe with the the idea of really creating the space here that was really the important for me that to take this uh, opportunity to yeah maybe try something that is n not making the best separation to show painting because that's not the best way for sure because uh, you I'm losing a lot of space by doing this if you want you, you can we can show like three times more paintings mm -hmm. if you separate the space in a smarter way <laughs> to do that but like I wanted to really have the the, the experience of the um, of the architecture the, the, that will be an entire part of the show even if it's to you know sacrifice <laughs> like uh, uh, like uh, other paintings to show, and I think it, it comes with this, um, and we have a very good example you know next to the, the hotel with the church. That's uh, as a, as a, as an artist, as a painter, I'm, I'm and I'm as many of many of us fascinated in in, in awe and in, in when we when you go to different temples, but obviously the, the tradition in, in, in Italy mm -hmm. of uh, of fresco architecture, sculpture that's you know form this. You know those, those fantastic uh, uh, spaces and the cathedral and churches and temples and uh, and I think every time you you experience art in those spaces, it's definitely quite a unique experience. And in as we sometimes call the museums, in in uh, you know the new cathedral or the new you know the the they are like somehow like they, they, they are built to make you feel you know with space like lights. You know I mean we see it with this one very very like ambitious kind of uh, lines. Uh, so it, for me that that that, that was uh, and it, it is important like uh, as you said in the beginning to really try to create that um, that that experience even if it's as the ruins theme it's it's not uh, it's something very ephemeral that uh, will vanish. With the murals, w would you start from a sketch or how that does that work? Um, you mean like when actually? So this is, this those four murals are uh, based on. The, so that's the same thing that we saw before with the the Fragonard, the Boucher. Uh, so those are directly, I don't know how exactly to call them, like copies of a production of. So yeah, that's the the. So that's the the painting of uh, of Berklin that the the mural is um, based on. So you can see it's 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 fairly close. So what I do, I project the uh, mm -hmm. the the so it's the, the proportions are exactly the same. Then I, I in this case I remove the uh, the little horse, the little character on his horse, uh, because that was um, that not that's what I mean. I love the, this horse on this painting, but for the, the, the actual project that I was trying to do, it was really the runes that uh, that I wanted to focus on, and also I remove uh, all the and all the other ones. There's birds that are also removed. And I simplified some of the, um, some of the. Uh, I mean, the, actually, the, the painting is very small, so there's a lot of tiny um, brush, and the, mine is extremely mm. big. So that's uh, it's, uh, and it, mine is probably much quicker made than his. <laughs> so there's definitely a loss of details. But uh, and I also like um, choose black and whites for different reasons. But it was also a, a way to really kind of uh, 
make like a distinct, a clear distinction, like almost like a edited from the uh, the original well, one. Show. Exactly, yeah, mm -hmm. in the in the in the show, and mm -hmm. uh, and then yeah, we uh, um, um, I hang that uh, the, those pastels on top of it, um, and those. Four runes based on uh, on on Berkeley are really like the uh, kind of they're all on the outside of the mm -hmm. structure, so they kind of as you described the, like before they're they're more like the really the current project like the uh, the all the old new works mm -hmm. and uh, the, the 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 new concept and inside when you go in it's the idea of the uh, Early half mid uh, medium career of <laughs> idea that it's like uh, a yeah ten years kind mm -hmm. of period of uh, mm -hmm. of painting which is the first time that I, that I, that I do that and it's it's been very very exciting. Um. Maybe we can discuss how you came to this idea of the ruins because when you first presented the model, the subject of the murals was not defined. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> So it, it was clear that uh, you wanted to present each genre in a separate room, so we will have landscape, portrait, and still life, caves and rocks, each in a separate room, but outside these spaces, yeah. you didn't know yet what you wanted to present. And no, it's, it's uh, I mean, it's kind of often the case, but uh, in that case it was kind of interesting because I made the model, the, stru the structure was made really, and we have to remember that the, you, I visited in 2018 and uh, we decided this space very quickly, so I did the model like, you know, almost three years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, yeah, two or three years ago, and the structure was very, very, um, very close to this, some, just some detail. And I think the family of work I also came up to very quickly, like, oh, I'm going to like put this, the still life, landscape, rocks, and, and caves, and just the human portrait in the middle. But so and then I did that model. There was just no color on it. Um, and they stayed for like months and months and months. And basically what, hap what happened, I'm just waiting to, <laughs> to, to, to get the idea for the murals. And I, I do sketches, and, and uh, I, I mean, I was not really panicking, but I was like, okay, nothing is coming in. <laughs> All my ideas are quite bad. I was, I mean, you know, when you you do a little cut and it's like, okay, that's not obviously not going to work, and uh, and you just basically worried that it's going to, it's going, something's going to come. And at the same time, I was doing this uh, this this uh, project uh, uh, for another museum in in uh, in in, uh, in Washington in the U.S. And uh, that that's because of the specificity of the project, I uh, started to work of the idea of the runes. Um, and uh, and then basically I think like oh like actually didn't keep that idea for this project but th mm -hmm. then somehow like that's kind of fitted very well on the uh, on this project and I think then I started to I think feel oh maybe what was in my in my experience anyway like you have a, an intuition or like you feel oh that's and you just I'm someone anyway that you will be okay I'll I'll, I'll put an image I put the collage and I, I wait and I see. I, I wait to see what I see in it, what I understand in it. And I, I did that, and I, I, I mean, it sounds a bit obvious, but I was like, oh, the, the COVID thing was definitely happening, and there was this idea of change, decay, destruction, re reconstruction that was really happening. And, uh, and, uh, and then what was interesting is when I came here, uh, it's really, I think, what it really came to, to for me, like, oh, that was actually what was almost the... The, the one of the um, the, uh, the 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 reason of those ruins was actually the actual almost history of that particular place and almost mm -hmm. the city i mean the ticino is very important for architecture and there's a lot of discussion around it there's a lot of uh, you know fiery debates about some of the buildings around here uh, there's been a lot of destruction even very recently in the city that there's a ruins right now uh, and uh, it's easy to remember that uh, for the, the local people that, uh, you know, before this museum, there mm -hmm. was a ruins right here of building this you know, apartment. was an hotel before that was constructed on a very old church that was a covenant that was a ruins for a, a long time as well. And the church itself is some kind of a ruined state of, mm -hmm. you know, beautiful or, old mm -hmm. architecture. So this entire square, mm -hmm. also you see what, what is a beautiful view around you. You have a very, like... Um, very direct sense of what the very classic idea of the runes typic typically like developed by Berkeley is really talking exactly about that, those kind of feeling that we right. witness here, this, mm -hmm. this nature versus humans, this 
almost battle, this constant battle mm -hmm. of, uh, of the human kind of power against nature and the nature's, you know, taking over back or like the regret that we have <laughs> when we build things. Uh, and uh, and, I, and uh, again, that was an, intu an intuition and there was like few, you know, starting point and, and now I, I, I realize that uh, in my own storytelling, that's, that works very well mm -hmm. for me now. <laughs> what about the torsos that you put them on? So the torso, like the, you mean the mm -hmm. pastels mm -hmm. on top of it. So yeah, that also came like kind of a similar time probably. I didn't really, I knew that I, I will put like, uh, actually at some point there was the heads mm -hmm. in front of it. Uh, instead of, now the two heads are in front of the, the show, but at some point I wanted to do four and they were like in, in front of the, 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 those runes. But then I changed and I put in those creases. So those creases have a specific uh, kind of starting point that, uh, that I started to take some uh, some of um, Renaissance drawing, um, some like from Boccioni. I mean, it's different people, but those are um, are all based on on on, um, on Boccioni drawings. And there, uh, and basically, I was kind of trying to find the um, the moment where you still recognize a body and. Uh, and uh, to just mm -hmm. cut some parts that it becomes something else, and also like trying to understand what is the the creases in, uh, mm -hmm. in 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 nudes, which is basically this moment where you know the flesh goes in and mm -hmm. it creates that curve that painters <laughs> loves to paint because that's what gives. But it's also one of the most erotic. Um, part of which nudes. we find in the fruit as well. You find in the fruit, <laughs> that, but people like love the like it goes in, mm -hmm. yeah. and uh, and the most kind of sexual parts mm -hmm. of our anatomy mm -hmm. have mm -hmm. that, but also the most kind of disgust, disgusting parts of or the one that we don't want to see mm -hmm. have this exact. Also, it it uh, echoes, you know, like we have more and more creases when we get older, um, and uh, so there's like um, there's all those little different mm -hmm. elements that uh, echoes the idea of the runes and the idea of change and decay. And on top of the, those uh, body type creases, there's uh, there's uh, different flies and butterflies, insects that are also like I mean fairly obvious, but direct reference mm -hmm. to the history of still life and those kind of elements that um, symbolize and tell that story like in a in a very uh, kind of direct way because of obviously like the insects change forms and sometimes die very quickly and flies obviously are uh, are connected to uh, to death and like um, and, all, and all that so maybe now we move inside the exhibition <laughs> let's go in <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah that's the two heads that now uh, so here you can really see the structure that was presented in the model and the sequence of the rooms and each room will introduce us to a specific subject and we start with landscapes. Yeah, so the first, yeah, the first room, so but yeah, there's like really f five rooms uh, that you saw with this, this, this very central four arcs architecture that gives this very mm -hmm. like uh, direct uh, perspective uh, to, the, um, to the space with those two heads that I guess echoes very directly to the head that is uh, outside the museum that look at the, the sunrise. Um, so maybe like, uh, the, the, I think for me like the, the, um, the idea of those heads was really uh, made, made uh, of the, 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 the aesthetic of the temple uh, that you have those kind of godlike mm -hmm. uh, presence that, uh, that you really don't really know um, uh, kind of who they are, but also what they're looking at. Uh, are they like kind of just completely like not in our world because they're looking, you know, uh, you know, behind us and like uh, more forward than us, uh, or they are completely like uh, <laughs> like maybe some gods like completely gone or empty. Um, and so there's like kind of this idea uh, uh, there. And then yeah, the first room is the landscape um, with the, the so it's uh, I choose. Uh, um, a series of, uh, of six landscapes that all have the sun, um, mm -hmm. uh, sunsets, um, because it's well, it's it's a motif that I've been really uh, um, enjoying, kind of exploring. Um, I've been like saying that I'm not a painter that, or I'm not an artist that uh, will describe uh, my uh, <laughs> my um, attraction to some of the motif for formal. Um, 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 problematic, like some say, oh, like 
trees are great. You know, the Mondrian kind of uh, mm -hmm. uh, idea, the very modernist. Is like they, they give you a great structure that you can basically explore and like really like explore like more like a, a formal or like a aesthetic. Like I, I, I'm, I think I'm more in the from a symbolist mm -hmm. um, type uh, kind of tradition. I guess that's why the, the Valotor is maybe very important uh, for me. Oh yeah, that's the. <laughs> So sometimes a sample in my own canvas. I, was, I knew that was coming. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, I took that line from uh, our great uh, uh, Felix Vallotton, a uh, paint, Swiss painter. And since then, I've been using it uh, quite extensively. So you grew up in Lausanne? I grew up in Lausanne, yeah, yeah. He was born in Lausanne, yeah. So he you're allowed. Me. I'm allowed, yeah. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so I mean, Munk did that too. I mean, it's less straight, I guess, but <laughs> but it is pretty uh, it's pretty close too, and uh, and I think for me, like what, uh, what typically in the sunset, what what I, what I love about the the sunset is that uh, it's such a common, obviously, subject, and it's like, it's probably one of the things that we take the picture the most uh, that we um, you know, but also it's the thing that we maybe um, dismiss you know mm -hmm. as as uh, as people that love like uh, aesthetic uh, saying like, oh it's like pink uh, even if it's really not really possible to be cynical when you see a beautiful sunset and i think like for me there was there was an idea of course like oh like nothing is beautiful just because it's pink or it's purple that that, that doesn't really make sense uh, and we obviously all know that but uh, and i think it's interesting that uh, for me every if we're so fascinated by the um, the sunset, it's because it's really the only moments in the day, the sunset and the sunrise, that uh, especially in the ocean, that you actually can see what's happening around us in in the biggest scale possible. It's it's, it's the only time in the day that you can actually see the, the earth moving. Mm -hmm. uh, right now, you can't see it, but when you see it, when you look at the sunset, I mean, it takes like around you know 10 minutes for the the circle to go down, so you actually feel the movement fairly. Uh, Fairly, fairly easily, and uh, and I think if we love sunset, it's obviously because you somehow you at that point you really connect to that uh, to that immensity around you, and uh, and that makes that very beautiful. Mm. And it's obviously <laughs> so as far as we know, it's it comes every day. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so I mean, it's it's uh, and it's, I guess when you paint it and when you explore it, I think you you maybe try to just get closer to that to, to those to those um, to those connection to those relationship to um, to, to those kind of um, uh, ideas. And I think um, every time I paint it again, like I'm trying to uh, to feel that. Um. So here we have um, an image from the central part of the exhibition, so the, the room where uh, we have hung the, the portraits. And uh, you can see a glimpse also of the lateral rooms which have been painted by Sara Marnietti and her assistant with this incredible faux marble decoration. And a glimpse also of the cave paintings that are hung there. So. Yes, so the the the, the 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 central room is kind of hosting the the humans in the show <laughs> because all the rest are not there. There, there's like landscape with the sunset, then it is those still life which fruits the, the the caves and the rocks, which are all I guess what we call natural uh, uh, elements and not human-made um, uh, objects. And in the in the center, you have this this series. Of portraits that uh, that's I guess that's the room that covers like the <laughs> longest time period because it's there's the one that is from 2012 or 13 and the last one is probably this year or, or very very just very now and um, and um, and I choose a series of portraits that uh, they don't I've been doing some with like another elements mm -hmm. either an animal or a flower mm -hmm. uh, they're always very very simple <laughs> but uh, who are those people? So those people. <laughs> Tricky <they're>, question. Uh, <laughs> good question. Yeah. Uh, well, I like the fact that you recognize them straight away as humans. Um, yeah, well. <laughs> <laughs> you don't like. Okay, they're not like uh, you know a dog or a cat or a plant. They're like okay, this is. But also you're like oh, this is probably not someone that exists. Uh, so are they idealist types, or do you start from real portraits? No, I never start no. with. Uh, I mean, never, very lately I've been doing few 
uh, portraits from uh, from a person that exists, but it's mm -hmm. it's very new. But I, you know, maybe, who knows? Maybe I will <laughs> go there more. And uh, but all the portraits that I've done since since that that time, they're um, they're really not based on uh, on any. Uh, and I guess it echoes like the um, the maybe the antique story, uh, like uh, uh, idea of the face that is an idealized ideal, ideal, idealized uh, face mm -hmm. that. Uh, and for me, what is it maybe interesting in those portraits? It's making the connection with the uh, this idea from the Greek sculpture that uh, mm -hmm. in the Western culture we've always been looking as like, oh, this is really the perfect face. It's really the perfect body. This is like the perfect aesthetic. And obviously, there's there's back and forth to it, but it's the, it's like something that is always mm -hmm. uh, coming back in the in, in our Western culture. Um, and uh, what is interesting right now is that perfect face. That is, you know, kind of the Greek face is is very um, uh, explore in in two kind of parts of our um, kind of uh, way of dealing with our face and our appearances is the all the filter that the um, the phone provide us mm -hmm. uh, that really makes our face more and more let's say uh, like perfect like mm -hmm. I mean that's, that's our the our idea of perfection I guess uh, which is like a slight, you know, it's like slightly curved here. The nose kind of very thin. The eyes a little bit like a bit like that, like slightly bigger, and uh, and um, and like a little bit of angle here. And you know, obviously nobody has that face uh, in in the world, but somehow we seems to constantly be very attracted to a face that is, nobody has. And also the other part is some people uh, modify their face as a, mm -hmm. and. Uh, there is even an Instagram account that uh, that does this kind of interesting thing of um, posting, you know, like collecting photos of um, of different movie stars or um, you know singers or even just like people, normal people that uh, that have exactly the same face. And uh, and it's when you look at a magazine or and it's it's what is it for me? What is interesting is that the um, this. It's this idea of beauty that is, is clearly not who we are, and uh, and even if we have you know all those like moments of like yeah let's maybe put you know model or advertising with mm -hmm. real people, we seems to always go back to mm -hmm. like mm, actually we should have a face that nobody has, mm -hmm. and it's uh, so I guess like I'm I'm trying to explore a little bit of that, and like uh, maybe uh, what I'm trying to as the uh, the tradition of this different tradition of portrait, but one of the ones that we know in the West is the idea that you have to paint the inside of the person mm -hmm. uh, and not just the outside. Like if you're a good portraitist, like like say like uh, like Rosalba, very good. But the Rosalba is a d d different again, a different. Uh, but let's say Rembrandt will be like the obvious example. Uh, it will be like always oh, really capturing like you know the suffering or like the uh, the, amb the anger, the ambiguity of the person. And for me, like I'm trying maybe to do the same, but with those faces uh, and trying to understand what is maybe inside or outside or what's the connection uh, b b between the two. Um, yeah, so here we have uh, uh, maybe that's a good uh, a slide for talk to talk about uh, Rosalba uh, Car 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 Carriera um, that had uh, been having a very big influence uh, in my work because uh, when I started to do pastel I didn't really know much about uh, the history of pastel. I kind of started it as, as, as a fashion instrument for a mm -hmm. technique, and uh, and then uh, the more I was getting into it, the more I was really getting into that technique. Uh, I, I started to basically, you know, discover some artists. Mm -hmm. And the first time that I saw the um, the 18th century golden age of pastel, which is you know the the, the century where there's an actual boom of pastel artists, I was not really I was not ready for it. Basically, I was not ready for the you know, Rococo aesthetic and this abundance of portrait that was still I needed like maybe a year or two. And uh, and then, I, you know, slowly I, went, I was going back to that and I, I started to become more and more familiar with uh, with the, the figure of Rosalba mm -hmm. Carriera that, uh, that I started to be completely fascinated by. And so she is this uh, Venetian um, artist that... Uh, that was uh, kind of trained uh, as a miniature painting uh, painter in Venice, and she was already extremely successful with that business. And she started to use pastel to do portrait, and very quickly, like she was extremely uh, talented at it. And uh, and everybody from all Europe wanted to to have a portrait uh, from her, either a portrait that re representing uh, 
uh, the, 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 the poser or like an idealized, and that's also maybe why it's interesting, this Rococo period from our mm -hmm. uh, time, because there's a simil some similar things with the makeup, with the transformation of the face, mm -hmm. as we know with the wig and the white makeup and, and, mm -hmm. and all that in all the, the different court of mm -hmm. Europe. And uh, she, what happened is in, in, um, she moved to Paris for only one year. Uh, she refused almost all the time. She was invited everywhere to different courts of Europe. But she was like, no, no, I don't want to travel. She was single and she was with her sister and mm -hmm. her family. And uh, she was just, I want to do my business here. She was um, very successful and very, very good business, business woman. And uh, she, uh, she went to Paris for one year too, and she was very successful there. But she had a tremendous impact in the, in the art scene in Paris to bring the pastel and a type of aesthetic that really changed the, um, the, uh, the aesthetic in, in, in France and really kind of, kind of there was, there was a, a huge amount of, of, of pastel artists that uh, emerged from that time. And as a person that loves pastel, uh, uh, it's basically only that period that you have this amount of people do, using that medium because after the French Revolution, um, this kind of mod, this, uh, this trend completely vanished for, 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 for various reasons. Uh, until some glimpse, and we always say, oh yeah, like uh, the impression is supposed to be used pastel, but actually mm -hmm. not really, because it's only the guy, I guess, mm -hmm. that is used pastel, and he's still, I would say, half half in his production of you know masterpieces. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not only, uh, as <laughs> Rosada, she only did mm -hmm. uh, pastels, and all the artists mm -hmm. at that time. Would pastel. you use just regular mass market crayons, or what did you get them? Do you produce them yourself? So I'm using mm -hmm. three different brands mm -hmm. of, of pastel. The first one that I started to was uh, the kind of also from an ancient brand, but uh, a very big brand now called Sennelier. And then I discovered a much smaller one that's called Unison, that is a British brand that mm -hmm. is much more recent. Uh, and then I, uh, I discovered the kind of the, the, uh, the Rolls Royce of, <laughs> of, uh, of pastel called the, the Rocher Pastel which they have a really incredible story in terms of, uh, so they're obviously Parisian uh, <laughs> uh, pastels that, uh, that actually were kind of created mm -hmm. in, in during that time, during the, the 18th century. Uh, and then this person, Henri Rocher, which was a pharmacist, mm -hmm. bought the company uh, at the, at in, 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 the, um, in the late um, 19th century and kept going in his Grand granddaughter or granddaughter now uh, granddaughter I guess it's uh, it was it was it was an old time took it back uh, and she's basically by herself now mm -hmm. doing all this pastel by hand you have to roll the pastel and she has another person that is loved the job so she came from the the states mm -hmm. actually so they're only two doing those incredible mm -hmm. uh, objects that uh, still use recipes and like uh, they had they use a lot of like old material to make them. And they definitely have the highest um, right. uh, quality mm -hmm. of, especially pigments. Mm -hmm. uh, Here we get close also even to makeup, to makeup art. Have you ever been interested in, in doing makeup, in theater makeup, opera makeup? Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I mean, that's mm -hmm. a very good point because what happened is that when I, my first pastel that I did, it, it was a portrait and, the, I, and I, it took me a long time to, I mean, that's maybe the thing with the runes and the situation here. It was, I put in makeup on them, I put in high shadows and, the, and mm -hmm. lipstick. Mm -hmm. And uh, the first time that I did it, it was the first portrait that I did after I, you know, bought my pastel box. Uh, and then I kept doing it, kept doing it. And uh, quite often it, I will be asked, like, also why, why they have makeup. And I, don't, I didn't really know. And I, you know, I was like, oh, I don't, I didn't put any makeup on them. <laughs> and uh, and the uh, and more and more I learned about the pastel is that uh, there's a, there's a really. A, a very, very clear connection between the two. Mm -hmm. And actually in the 18th century, pastel maker were also producing makeup for, uh, there was the same product, produce, uh, which was obviously very bad for the skin. But you could buy, you know, the same rouge that they were putting on the skin and they were mm -hmm. obviously covered mm -hmm. of powder. And they were completely white and, you know, those big red faces. And of, so of course, when you will paint a portrait uh, of someone with pastel, you were basically painting a painting, mm -hmm. and they was using the same surface, so it looked exactly the same. Mm -hmm. It was because it was literally the same material. Okay. It's like painting. It was the animal lecture, right? Painting a portrait with the skin of someone, <laughs> and uh, so there was this very clear, oh. clear connection mm -hmm. with, with that. So th it's when it's kind of more like I, when I discovered, I was like, oh, that's why you know I'm, uh, I'm, um, I'm interested in it. And also like the uh, the, gen the gender discussion and the gender fluidity. That's mm -hmm. it's it's a debate that is. Uh, Sometimes we feel, oh, it's, it's, it's now and before. It was 
of course, history, as we all know, it's not a, a, a constant kind of curve that goes into one other direction. And actually, that that's, uh, that's, uh, century, it's like for, for, few, for get 50, 60 years, uh, there was a lot of discussion, there was a lot of um, um, play with gender, and men were like dressing like women, uh, women dressing like men, makeup, there was, and of course, the French Revolution really disliked that, <laughs> that, uh, that, that part of, uh, of France. It was seen as completely decadent, mm -hmm. uh, completely frivol, and like all this uh, idea of, you know, like all the Boucher and Fragonard, and, and it's in some regards still seen sometimes by some people in the arts or in history that's something that, oh, Boucher, like it's terrible, it's mm -hmm. so like, you know, you will sometimes even hear, like, oh, that's for women, it's like all makeup mm -hmm. and clothes and, and at that point, they were very well, well aware of that, the, the very tran transgressive uh, idea of that. Mm -hmm. And of course, when uh, you know, people like David came into the game, it was definitely uh, back, back to order. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, and uh, yeah, you still see the traces. Like one mm -hmm. of the, I, I sometimes say one of the, um, one of the reasons that uh, so many little people use pastel, it's, it's definitely a leftover from that really cuts from the big academies and say like mm -hmm. pastels, it's it's a hobby medium mm -hmm. and it's for women uh, to paint like flowers and portraits and you know if you if you're a real man artist you definitely need to use oil painting big canvas and you know paint some battles <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah you I mean we we <laughs> we still some good leftover from that for sure okay we, here we see the interior of one of the lateral rooms with the team of the cave. Maybe one thing that we didn't really ask you is what is it that it's so appealing to you in pastel that you cannot find in another medium that maybe... Um, well, I, like, for me, when I started to do pastel, I was using a lot of oil, and it was, there was a very clear, uh, pretty practical uh, problem for me. I was too slow doing oil mm -hmm. painting, and, uh, <laughs> and I was just struggling a lot with the technique, to be honest. And uh, basically, it was pa uh, oil painting allowed you to always like start again, start again, start again. You know, and some people love that. And like you know, you can. And I was never satisfied with a color, a composition. And I was like really constantly like, and you know, the drying time and everything. And basically, it will take me 12 months to to do an oil painting. So I was feeling that I was like kind of frustrated because I couldn't like explore things. I was a little bit like uh, stiff. Mm -hmm. And uh, and when I discovered pastel, the the immedi immediacy of the, the medium, because it's kind of the opposite. You can't really build, build on layers. So some painter will say, well, that's why it's, you know, mm -hmm. pa oil painting is great, which is true, like you can... And it's also more intense. There's more pigment and less solvent, right? Yeah, mm -hmm. and uh, well, then there's like quality that mm -hmm. you will never have with, mm -hmm. uh, with mm -hmm. other... Every mm -hmm. medium has mm -hmm. the, the, the quality. And, and uh, for me, like uh, pastel, there's something immediate. The, the, in terms of colors, uh, it is by far the best uh, color that you can get because a good pastel is literally only pigments. There's no, yeah. there's almost nothing mm -hmm. else in it. There's a tiny bit of binder, but it's completely different than oil. Typically, that's uh, the binder. I mean, the, literally the oil or the medium that you're going to use will affect the color. Like oil is a bit yellow, mm -hmm. and uh, there's no way around. And acrylic has s similar problem with the, the plastic uh, uh, medium they use. Um, as a, as 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 a, as what it, what color is meaning a pigment when you you know paint uh, pastel is basically uh, you basically put pigments on the canvas and it's just it stays very delicately and very fragilely mm -hmm. on on the on the canvas and uh, and I, I I think very quickly I loved the idea that it was extremely fragile and that was like really like something very. Uh, how do you deal with those handling issues that pastels have? <laughs> yeah, that's a, the collector's problem. And not the <laughs> I, no, it's my problem too, obviously. Mm -hmm. But um, no, so the, 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 the main thing is to you have, you have to frame the, mm -hmm. the pastel. So you have to protect the, uh, the pastel. And I think maybe one of the reasons that I started to do uh, murals, it was also to, well, let's show, showcase this medium mm -hmm. without the glass mm -hmm. and on a, kind of on a grain stage of a big wall. Mm -hmm. um, and you maybe see here the, the, the white and the black is, is very matte and takes the light mm -hmm. in a very, uh, I mean, it's black and white mules, but, uh, uh, but framing, and that was obviously back when pastel was extremely popular in the, in the 18th century, like the, uh, the problem was the size of the glass. So mm -hmm. you can only do 
you can produce like it was not like now. You can only produce a type of glass, and of the glass was more fragile and and not anti UV, anti static, and all that. Now you now we we have much better um, plexi and glass, but uh, of course, I mean, <laughs> as, as here we know, we 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 you know sometimes we we. Um, we face problem with we lose uh, a bit. <laughs> yeah yeah with uh, mm -hmm. with with mm -hmm. dealing with uh, pastel. I will say that in contemporary arts, the amount of objects you know that are created that are extremely fragile or made out of something completely not made to do art mm -hmm. and now is so common and people are very used to you know ship uh, maintain those objects uh, and uh, and it's it's very different of course when we're creating arts that you know there was no uh, there was no asphalt, and it was just like pavement that you have to <laughs> carry your uh, your pastels in it, and uh, and there was no um, humidity kind of control and all that. So like I think now we're allowed to, we, uh, but they are they are they are fragile objects, mm -hmm. and uh, and they need to be handled with uh, yeah mm -hmm. with great care. So maybe to close the sneak preview into <laughs> the exhibition. As we have seen before, uh, history of art is very important to you and uh, you're very curious and you always find inspiration in artists that have lived in many different places, different periods. And here, for example, we have a perfect <laughs> still life by Chardin. And, um, yeah, also a, a very, uh, one of the... <laughs> Biggest artist from the 18th century that did a lot actually of self-portraits of Pastel at the, at the end of his life, and he, I, I came to him when I was doing still lifes in oil painting, uh, and uh, I guess I was <laughs> trying to be as good as him, but without without much success. Uh, <laughs> he's he's uh, yeah, I mean he's, he's obviously a fantastic uh, still life painter because be, uh, I think he's one of the. Uh, um, we all know the the the, the, uh, the Flemish tradition of still life. Uh, but I think he brings something uh, very modern, but also very witty and very uh, bring humor. And, uh, and of course, he brings the 18th century French uh, sensuality and erotism mm -hmm. in his in his still lives. Uh, and uh, yeah, like typically the peach here with those two cherry uh, next to it is, is is really like kind of in your face in terms of uh, of the sensuality of it. So like. We have to, I guess, maybe remind ourselves that still our day uh, to to communicate, you know, sexuality, erotism, those kind of play we still use, uh, uh, you know, the the peach emoji, like the, all those fruits are still mass massively used, and they really work and make you know young people, or the, you know, older people, or whoever are using. So the idea of like. Um, talking about uh, desire, sexuality, using foods is obviously a very old um, uh, idea. And uh, I mean, you know, we all know that uh, our uh, friend Adam like uh, did uh, eat the apple. <laughs> and uh, and that's, it, it keeps going. And I think it's, it's very interesting, uh, I think, for me to, uh, to kind of diving in those very like uh, recurrent motif that the human have. So it's because it's easy to feel disconnected to the, from the past, maybe uh, when you're like, Surrounded by, let's say, technology and science, but when you do actually do arts, it's f what happens is the complete opposite. You feel completely connected to the past, and you feel that really not not much are changing, and we're very similar. Um, you know, it's it's the big kind of uh, uh, epiphany of visiting, you know, like or seeing like the uh, the 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 the, the palatic cave of seeing like, oh my goodness, I guess it's the same. They were doing the same thing, and uh, and it's you know a while back. Uh, and uh, and I feel I feel for me like uh, we very often uh, associate, and which is true obviously, art to like the uh, the avant-garde and like the breaking the uh, the, um, the you know like the, the rule and bringing something new, but and that that exists at a different time. Uh, but very often also art is a, connect, a, a connector to the past, and typically I think right now probably even more because like what's Typically, like let's say, the beginning of the 20th century, like the uh, uh, the, uh, the oldest beginning of the av the, the, the avant-garde, like futurist or cubism, like has an idea of the the future that is extremely positive. Like it's it's going to be all great, uh, and and the future is going to be fantastic. All this technology is going to bring all all good, 
of course, <laughs> they didn't. And, uh, and what, what happened, I think, today, it's we have the opposite kind of philosophy. We see the future as something extremely, I mean, our <laughs> is even worse right now. But the global warming and, and different issues really makes our vision of the future extremely grim. We really don't, you know, we, so often you will hear, well, in 100 years, we're probably not going to be here anymore. <laughs> and uh, and it's, it's, I, mean, I think it makes us probably see the past very often with nostalgia or with, um, you know, fascination. Mm. How often you will hear, oh, food was better before. Maybe like, oh, Lugano mm. was better before. It was not all those houses or whatever it is. <laughs> uh, less pollution. And, uh, and it's, it's, it's also an interesting thing to explore because uh, I did at the end of the day, we live uh, right now, and we're just going forward, not past. But it's you know this art really, for me, really allowed you to have this uh, those very organic connection to the past, and like you can really feel them when you see it and when you practice it. So maybe before taking question from our audience. <laughs> We wanted to tell everyone that we are currently, right now, working on a <laughs> catalogue about this exhibition <laughs> because it's such an important project that has completely transfigured our museum. Of course, we wanted to document it properly and uh, so the, the book will feature not only all the works that are in the exhibition but many exhibition view that hopefully will keep the memory forever of what is happening right here in Lugano. And the catalogue, we are shooting it, uh, shooting the, the picture these right days. Now. So <laughs> it will be available at, uh, at the end of July. Mm. So. so we hope your interest has been stirred. We, like, we opened the show on Saturday in a week. So it's a big public opening the entire day. So you are welcome then to come see next week on Saturday. In the meantime, uh, maybe uh, there are questions uh, in uh, your minds that might have popped up during uh, Nicole's <laughs> explanations about what he's doing. Yes, Celia. <laughs> My favorite color is pink, uh, at the moment anyway, and I also have another favorite color that is like uh, is kind of mustardy green in pastel, it makes this really, um, it's also actually in a, in a golden acrylic and it's called uh, um, uh, golden yellow or green, green yellow, green yellow or something like that. Uh, and that's my two favorite color. <laughs> so uh, yeah, I can say I have two favorite colors. Of course, having a favorite color doesn't really uh, make sense. But uh, I'm, I'm uh, yeah, I love uh, I love actually um, also s you know like uh, um, reading and and and, uh, and exploring uh, what we associate was the with the because a color is not a word um, and the word is only kind of. Uh, a description with with that comes with ideas, and it's not a color. Is obviously there's there's as many colors as you know under when you use Photoshop, you you know that because every pixel is a different information. But it's the same thing with our eyes. So when we say blue, and we we're really going to describe like millions and millions of different blue. That's just to and all those um, um, kind of. Uh, Association are very interesting uh, um, for me, and I, I love like exploring them. And there's so many. Uh, uh, I mean, the most famous anecdotes about colors is the uh, the, the blue, the history of the blue that uh, from the, the 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 Greek that don't really have a word for blue. So even some some historian like a uh, hundred years ago were saying I mean, maybe they didn't see blue. Like I don't know, we don't see. It. Of course, they were seeing blue, but they were not basically describing what we call blue as blue, and then the, the, the famous uh, you know, ultramarine discovering during the Renaissance, that, uh, that makes a very clear connection between empowering a color and make a color the most popular, connected to a very technical discovery, and also a market of, uh, of what is extremely expensive. Uh, and a whole the history of color is kind of based on, and, you know, not, it's not like obviously uh, uh, by um, by any chance, or because humans love blue. Because in the West, yeah, people, if you ask, most of the time they will say blue. 
that's kind of in the studies, they will very not often say yellow, for example. <laughs> that's my favorite color. Or, and green also is very often, you know, uh, like maybe another like quick little anecdote with the color green that is, uh, that is always kind of um, uh, entertaining to, to, to kind of think about is that the, uh, the, the pigments that was used for, for a lot of the green in fabric because actually very often the symbolic of color is not coming from painting but from, um, from fabric and clothes. That's where, you know, I mean, we know with the, like some of the religious painting that described those, those fabric. But uh, the green was made with extremely toxic uh, produce. And a lot of uh, actors will wear green. Some of them will die on stage and will die acting in green. And to this date, it's still, you know, kind of forbidden to wear, to, uh, to wear green in theater and use green too much because it's still that this kind of this connection to that, to this, uh, even the, the, le the legend say that Napo Napoleon was died maybe because his, in, you know, in his little last room was covered by that green that was made of those very toxic metal. Uh, so every, um, I think, assumption of colors also come with a great deal of uh, very kind of spicy and interesting uh, anecdotes. <laughs> Hi, what is the beauty for you? <laughs> Easy question. <laughs> <laughs> uh, for me, beauty is a uh, is the uh, it's a word that we can uh, maybe that describe attraction to something, um, and I think attraction is a is a you know very important power in uh, in um, in creation um, and. Uh, like I use different kind of maybe like uh, kind of uh, but it's always interesting. Like we we kind of believe that the uh, life on the earth happened. I mean we don't know exactly how, obviously what happened, but then I'm really by far not an expert on it. And uh, but because of the tides of the the water, right? The water was coming in and coming out and creating those basically half wet, half um, half dry moments where some cells started to emerge and create something that became, became I guess, us at the end. <laughs> and what is interesting is that the, uh, the, way, the, the tide in, 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 in the sea and in, in the oceans are made because of the moon and the attraction because of the, the attraction of the moon. And, uh, and uh, it's really amazing to, those two things are completely tied together and they have the perfect attraction to create those ties. They will be too close, it will be a disaster, and too far, nothing will happen. So it's the perfect attraction that works together that creates you know, a lot of things that, that happen. And I think for me, well, that's first of all, I think very beautiful. <laughs> and, uh, and I think beauty is, a, is, a, is a often described you know, in, in, in aesthetic, but also in human interaction. Uh, when we think someone is beautiful, <laughs> uh, we, I think we, we want to say that I'm attracted to the person. That doesn't mean, you know, like, oh, this is beautiful and that's beautiful for everybody. It's just we're attracted to it. And this attraction, I don't think, is, um, is possible to explain. Uh, we, exactly, it's impossible to explain why the moon was exactly this size right there and it worked out. It's, uh, you can, and that's what is beautiful. You can go you can go on and like try to create your own kind of interpretation for it, and you never know why you're attracted to someone. It's it's one of the uh, the most beautiful mystery, I guess. <laughs> um, I'm very fascinated by your relationship with the past that you explained to us also very well in, in, the, in the talk. And a few months ago, I. and uh, made him more successful as well. <laughs> and so I was very fascinated by that and I thought it's very powerful how this, this relationship is not only in one direction but which reverse, so that you also influence an, an artist of the past and uh, somehow also you maybe you change the taste <laughs> but I don't know if that it's a conscious part of, of your of your research, of this relationship. 
No, no, of course. I mean, with Salvo, typically, it's, he influenced me, and uh, I saw his work, and uh, I loved it. And I, I, I found, I found his, his aesthetic, but also his whole trajectory and uh, his very um, subversive way of, of treating this, this particular aesthetic that he's, you know, his painting that, uh, um, that, that he started to do uh, after his, a part that is aesthetically completely different. Uh, I found I found it very, very extremely inspiring, and um, and I was I was shown his work. Uh, someone saw my work and said, "Oh, do you know Salvo?" Uh, and it was very, it was a long time ago, and uh, and I, f I own him a lot uh, for myself. So, so um, that's kind of kind of how I will position myself. That uh, you know I think he's a fantastic artist, and uh, and uh, he influenced me like a lot, and uh, and I hope like yeah, I hope that other people will will feel the same. Um, uh, that that you know the, the attraction, the love that <laughs> I felt when I saw the painting. Uh, I hope that other people can can feel that. But uh, it is like uh, it's art. Artist loves you know other artists, and it's 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 a constant interaction with the past. And there is many uh, example in art history where you know uh, uh, com like from Vermeer to like Vermeer to like that were completely out of fashion for a long time, and then comes back. And sometimes, yeah, but it, I mean, it, it, and, and there's, you know, and it's sometimes the period is very short, like, you know, some, sometimes someone can be very popular, obviously, and not popular, like, a few years later. And sometimes the, 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 the length is, is longer, and uh, it's never really to the artist to dictate that, obviously. Like, you, you I think you do what you do, and you feel very um, um, lucky when you meet an audience and, and you feel like, oh, people like, you know, are attracted to what I'm doing. It's obviously fantastic and if it doesn't happen, uh, you just keep going <laughs> and you have less, uh, you know, like uh, those like, uh, moments. But um, yeah, it's a very, it's a very important uh, aspect of, I think, making art and, and probably just consuming art in terms of seeing. You just always make those, those, those connections. <laughs> because it's, it's a quite a consequence. Have you have you ever thought to make a fresco? Yes. Because yeah, yeah no, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm definitely. Uh, I know. Uh, yeah, but I know how complicated it is, and um, and uh, also there's no point of making a, an ephemeral fresco. I mean, actually, uh, some you know, Camille Yonro does uh, use fresco, and I love her. Uh, her work and she used it as a you know also as a reference of the past, but also I think as the uh, as the very sp specific aesthetic of how the the paints kind of shine a little bit. It's very glittery, uh, and you have this kind of chalky kind of aspect, and it's also very flat because it's obviously in the wall. Uh, but I think for me, like um, with what I do, that will not make sense to do a fresco and to destroy it. But actually, while I'm saying that, I'm like, well, maybe it actually that will make sense too. But uh, <laughs> I, uh, yeah, no, I can't wait to uh, to try. And uh, you know, of course, like uh, uh, I'm the uh, ego ego artist. I want to do my uh, big uh, <laughs> like forever, like uh, fresco that uh, that will survive. Because it's true that in wall painting, only fresco survives. There's nothing else that I did. I know it was graffiti that lasts. If it lasts two years, that's already a success. It's kind of it, the paint ships, and it's and it's if you want and. Even, I mean, we preserve the painting better, but like you see how, you know, what we call the old master was obviously very, very conscious of the durability of the, of the practice, which obviously we totally not right now, but uh, I guess we think that we're all gonna disappear in a hundred years, so <laughs> we don't need to really. But yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll do fresco, I'll, I'll let you know. <laughs> <laughs> Do we have another question? Down there. Yes. I see. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. Thank you very much, Nicola, for your talk. I had a, a question related to the one just before, and it's about the fact that so many of your murals will actually be lost or have been lost, have been totally dismantled. And this, I think, is something that goes throughout your practice as you started with graffiti, which is something that really comes in and then another day is disappeared. So I wanted to ask you, how do you feel about this in general? And how do you feel about the fact that most of your, of your work is actually documented by photographs? How do you feel about 
this documentation, do you think can be representative of what you actually did, or not that much? If you can spare a couple of words on this, thanks. Yeah, no, I, I really love the fact that it's going to be uh, destroyed. And as I maybe explained a little bit before, that's allowed me to do a very specific type of mural. I will not do a painting of Berkeley, uh, you know, obviously that size and just keep it or show it. I will I'll only do it because it's going to disappear. Uh, so first, it, it allowed me to do a lot of things that I will not do uh, otherwise on a canvas or, you know, on other... other it's, it's, I do it because I know it's going to disappear. Um, and uh, for, so for me, like the idea that I do something that this actually makes me more um, um, relaxed about it, uh, and it's uh, it's maybe also part of the the the, the this idea of the performance that uh, you, you it exists only when you do it and you feel very relief of that. It's obviously I have the as I have the ego of the artist like oh I'm, I want to have to have my painting that's gonna be kept and uh, forever. Of course, I have that too, but it's, al it's also sometimes a feeling that is a little bit like, uh, you know, off, of course, and I'm, and I'm not lying, I'm not going to lie, that's many paintings that I, I mean, many paintings, I guess, yeah, too much, but some paintings that I did, I don't like them, and I felt they should be, like, destroyed. And, uh, and I know that's the case for a lot of artists, and some, some artists destroyed a lot of their work, you know, in, in during the career. Uh, and uh, so sometimes, actually, like, the idea, like, okay, I'm doing something, and then I don't have any control on it anymore, uh, it's actually like a little bit like, oh, I don't, you know, I mean, I'm fine with it, obviously, but the murals part really let me like uh, feel like, oh, you know, I'll, I'll do it, and uh, except for the fresco. <laughs> 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 like, and it, and, and it will disappear. After the, the, um, the, uh, the documentation is really a documentation. It's, uh, you know, it's like when you take a photo of, uh, of the sunset, you know, it's just, it, it of course has nothing to do with the experience of what you've been, it's, you document, I think, something for you, for your memory, and we, we know uh, that we have probably a much better, better memory that, uh, that the generation before, because we will have thousands of pictures that we say, you know, how many times I see a picture from 15 years ago, it's like, oh, I remember now this space. But if I, if I try to remember an exact space, of course, it will be very blurry. So for a mural, it's, it's really like, I think, the, uh, the, the idea, and of course, to share, you know, with people that uh, can't um, come to beautiful Lugano. <laughs> Thank you. So we hope to see you all uh, next week, by the end of next week or later. The shunt will run through uh, the rest of the year, even over Christmas, so there will be a lot of time. And spread the word. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs>